I'm delighted to be here today and to tell you about portraiture and the beholder's share from a brain science perspective. Sort of the central challenge of science in the 21st century is to understand the human mind in biological terms. This possibility emerged in the last 30 years of the 20th century when an interesting merger occurred between neuropsychology, cognitive psychology, the science of the mind, and brain science, the science of the brain, to bring together a new science of the mind. This new science of the mind is in a position to inform us not only about ourselves, about how we feel, think, learn, and remember, but also about consciousness, the base of emotion, the nature of free will. But in a larger sense, one would hope that as a result of this, neuroscience would be, provide a font of knowledge by interacting with other disciplines, and they might give some insights, for example, in our response to works of art. The idea is that someday, neuroscience, in fact, brain science in general, science in general, will become part of the common cultural enterprise, which is one of the purposes of these lectures. Uh, I find it hopeful that someday people will find science, and particularly brain science, as exciting as they find baseball and football. My son thinks it's the most ridiculous idea in the world, but anyway, <laughs> I put it forward to you. In my work as a scientist, I've often taken a reductionist approach to the problems that I work on. Uh, so my interest is in memory, and I've taken a very simple approach in which I take an elementary example and try to study it as thoroughly as possible. Now, when one thinks of painting, I thought from the very beginning that perhaps the best reductionist example is portraiture, because we really are beginning to have an intellectually satisfying understanding, which I hope to convey to you, of how portraits are represented in the brain. What I'm going to show to you is that one of the reasons we do this is the uh, face has many special features that are unique to faces as other objects, and they have an extensive representation in the brain. Let me begin by asking why a face is so important and why do we find them so fascinating, which is one of the reasons why portraits appeal to us so much. Amazingly, the person who addressed this issue was Charles Darwin. It was Darwin who first pointed out, as you obviously know, that we are biological creatures, that evolution is driven by sexual selection, that sex, this is 50 years before Freud, is central to human behavior, and that key to sexual attraction and to all social interactions is facial expressions. This was not at all obvious. He pointed out that all of our social encounters, how we seek a partner, how we make friends, how we avoid people, are determined really by their facial expressions because facial expressions mediate emotions. Now, he had another fantastic insight. He said, look, every person in this audience has the same features to their face, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and an oval surrounding. And as a result, this is universal. Every human being on the planet has those features. And therefore, emotional expressions, facial expressions, are likely to be conserved. They're likely to be a limited number of things you can do with those structures of your face, a limited number of ways you can express them. And in fact, he predicted there were six to seven different emotional expressions, and that's now been shown by Ekman and others repeatedly. And through those emotional expressions, we can either invite approach by being welcoming, attractive, happy, or we can invite avoidance by being fearful or threatening. So the valence of facial expression is extremely important in our interactions with other people. And all social encounters, that means economic, intellectual, as well as personal and social, are mediated through our faces. There are many remarkable features about the face that I hope to make clear to you. Uh, to begin with, face is extremely easy for us to recognize. A young child, two years old, can recognize one to 2,000 different faces without any difficulty. I remind you 
that computers with enormous computational capability have great difficulty recognizing faces. It's one of the most difficult tasks confronting them. Children that age can learn to recognize, if they're put into a monkey colony, a thousand different monkey faces. This is remarkable, because we think all monkeys look alike. Right? Because we don't have the familiarity with it. Not only do we recognize faces easily, but we recognize them in highly reduced form. So this is a Rembrandt self-portrait, and this is a line drawing of the Rembrandt self-portrait. We recognize Rembrandt as easily from a simple line drawing. In fact, if we exaggerate this, a point I'm going to return to later on, you'll recognize him even more. We recognize a cartoon of Nixon better than we recognize a photograph of the president and perhaps justifiably so. <laughs> <laughs> but what I really want to sort of do is bring the history of art and the history of science together. And the first person to do this was Viennese. This is Alois Regal, a rather unappreciated art historian, who said to himself, said it to others also in about 1890, Art history is going to die unless it becomes more scientific. And the science that it should align itself with is psychology. And the problem that it should focus on, this is a reductionist guy, right? The problem it should focus on is the beholder's share. How you, the viewer, respond to a work of art. The painting, he argued, is not complete without the viewer's response. This fascinated two of his disciples, they were not contemporaries, they came later. Ernst Chris, whom I knew personally, was a big influence on my life, a early a major art historian, who then became a psychoanalyst, who said, look, you and I, madame, look at the same work of art, we see it somewhat differently. What does that mean? That every work of art is ambiguous. And you and I bring somewhat different perceptions to it. When you think of that, you realize, if you and I see it differently, we're undergoing a slightly different creative experience in putting together the work of art. That means the beholder undergoes, in a modest way, a creative experience that parallels that of the artist in creating it. It's a very modest version of it, but that's exactly what's going on. Gombrich picked up on this and thought this was absolutely fantastic. And he began to study the philosophy and the cognitive psychology of art. And he read Bishop Berkeley's famous paper in which he pointed out a remarkable thing. That is, when I look at a person in the audience, I do not see the person. I only see the light reflected from the person, the photons emitted by that person. As a result, my retina reconstructs you with vastly incomplete information. There's no way I can distinguish the lady and the gentleman sitting next to her in the first row from photons coming from their body and their face. I need additional piece of information. Helmholtz, struggling with this problem, suggested what the two pieces of information are, and it's been verified since then. They're bottom-up and they're top-down. The bottom-up information is that we did not involve de novo yesterday. We've evolved through a long line of evolution, which Darwin described, and our brain evolved to work in an environment we call the world, and it expects certain things of the world. For example, if you see a source of light, the most likely source of that is above, because the sun, the major source of light, is above. If we see a person is very large and a person is very small, we're likely to think from perspective that the large person is closer to us than the far person, etc., etc. Our brain is built into that. Children at birth can recognize faces and they do it quite well because they have the built-in mechanism for seeing if it's got a circle, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, it's a face. You don't have to tell me much more, okay? So they are a built-in process and development process that tell you what do you can expect from the outside world. In addition, each of us has different experiences. We go to the Metropolitan Museum at different times, we see different works of art, we like different works of art, we have different personal lives. That interacts with our value judgment, with our aesthetic appreciation of art. That's the top-down process, that you and I, even though we have the same built-in brain, 
see it differently is because we've had different personal experiences that we bring to bear on a work of art. But he also argued, if that's true, if these bottom-up processes are based on the average expectable world in which we live, you should be able to trick the brain by creating something which is, you know, looks like it's average expectable, but ain't. The Kazuniga Square. You see these four beautiful white circles, and you see lying on top of that a black square with beautiful outlines. Do you all see that? Every one of you can see that? Would you raise your hand if you see it? I would just want to make sure that everybody's seeing it. You are making it up. <laughs> this is in your head. This is not out there. Let me show you. When these semicircles are organized, you fill in a square that simply is not there. This is a fooling of the bottom-up process. It expects to see this thing filled in completion, a Gestalt principle. If you unorganize these semicircles, you lose it completely. how we respond to faces psychologically, biologically, how we represent faces in the brain, how we represent body, how we represent the body in motion, how we represent emotion, how we represent empathy, how we represent theory of mind, that you have different aspirations than I have. I'm just going to focus on one, on faces. I'm going to show you what we know about facial recognition from a psychological point of view and then from a biological point of view. Faces are very special. And I love this face. This is an artist from Venice, Archimboldo. You probably, many of you know him, who worked in Vienna a lot of his career. And he loved to make paintings of, of faces using fruits and vegetables. And he allows me to demonstrate one of the absolutely spectacular features of portraits that and faces that distinguish them from all of the objects in the universe. If I take this glass of water and I turn it upside down, I'll of course spill the water, which I don't intend to do, but you will still recognize it as a glass. But if you turn a face upside down, you can't recognize it. Now this is an extreme example, okay? I'm gonna give you a more subtle example. If you look at these two images, some of you may recognize this. Mona Lisa. Right? You see that this is Mona Lisa, okay? But what you can't see when she's upside down is differences in facial expression. So even if you recognize your friend, your mother-in-law, upside down, with different facial expressions, you can recognize them. It's only when you turn them right side up you can see this is the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, this is Leonardo's enigmatic smile, magnificent painting, and here you see a distortion of the eyes and the mouth. Upside down, you simply can't do it. This is your brain, okay? More complicated than this, but I'm going to give you the beginner's introduction to the brain. You have four lobes. You have the occipital lobe, you have the temporal lobe, you have the parietal lobe, and you have the frontal lobe. Information for vision comes in the back of the brain. And the face area, it's a very large area, is in the inferior part of the temporal lobe. It has two parts to it, a posterior inferior and anterior inferior. In 1947, a neurologist by the name of Badama discovered soldiers that were wounded in warfare that had difficulty with face recognition. And he called that prosap agnosia. Prosap means face, agnosia means inability to recognize. People with traumatic injuries sometimes have injuries to the back of that region, in which case you can't see a face qua face. If the lesion is more anterior, it often is a developmental thing. Nine to 10% in this audience probably have some degree of prosognosia. But we now have some cellular insight into what happens into those areas. We have it both in humans, but we have particularly good information in, in the monkeys that has come from research that has been done originally by Charlie Gross and then by Marge Livingston and her colleagues, Doris Tsao and Winifred Weinreich, and it's really quite wonderful. 
Let me tell you the monkey stuff because it's in greater detail. They've discovered six areas which we, they call face patches. If you put an electrode into those areas, any one of those areas, 90% of the cells or more respond to faces. If you stimulate the central face patches, the others light up. Means that this is an interconnected set of cells, okay? If you record from different ones, they have different processing functions. Some give you the face head on, some gives you from the side, some gives you three dimensional view of the face. They deal with different aspects of the face. Let me just give you one example. This is a recording from one face patch, and this red firing is brrrr, the firing of the cells, okay? So if you show a monkey a picture of a monkey, why not? They like it. They fire. Brrr. If you show them a cartoon of a monkey, they like it even more. Remember Nixon's cartoon? Brrr, even more. <laughs> but it follows Gestaltist principles. It has to be holistic. For some reason we don't understand, it doesn't need the nose, but it's got to have two eyes and a mouth and a circle around it. You take out the mouth, no firing. You take out the eyes, no firing. You have the eyes, the mouth, and no circle, no firing. You have the circle, no, no, nothing inside, no firing. You've got to have all of the components. If you just empty out the eyes and the mouth, no firing. Turn it upside down, what happens? No firing. You exaggerate the features, the cells go wild. Let me finish by addressing why you come to the museum. And that is, do we have any insights into why we develop affection and love for works of art? Ronald Lauder, a neighbor, Neue Gallery, right down the block, uh, paid $135 million, the most that had ever been paid, this was about 10 years ago, ever been paid for a work of art, for Adele Blochbauer. He fell in love with this painting. He thought this was modern beauty personified. He appreciated, as many people did not, the sexual, the erotic symbols on her. The uh, rectangular symbols in Klimt's paintings indicate sperm, and the oval sim symbols indicate ova. So she's re reproductively capable, she's very seductive, and he absolutely fell in love with her. Uh, he thought this was the modern Mona Lisa. What systems in the brain get recruited for love of art? It turns out that there's an area in the prefrontal cortex that's recruited, but importantly, a system in the brain, a modulatory system in the brain that affects every component of the beholder's share, and that's the dopamine system. Now, the dopamine system doesn't simply get recruited for love of art, it gets recruited for many primary rewards like food, drink, and sex, very powerful in addiction. It gets recruited for romantic love and for love of art. Lauder sees this painting when he's 14 years old. He's wild about the painting. He comes from a very affluent family, could probably afford to buy it. No one's going to sell it to him. So he comes back to Vienna almost every summer, pining for this painting, OK? He later became ambassador to Austria with a residence in Vienna, seeing this painting all the time. People describe how much he wanted the painting. You could see what's happening to the dopaminergic system in his brain. It's just revving up, he's going wild. <laughs> I am confident, I'm absolutely confident that he would have paid $140 million for this painting had he been necessary to do it, but he was able to get it for 135. <laughs> so let me simply end with a statement of faith. I think we all believe that the greatest enterprise for the human mind has been and always will be, this is E.O. Wilson's language, an attempt to create linkages between the sciences and the humanities. I think in this generation, this is becoming possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>